in 1941, after the United States had declared war on Nazi Germany, around about the same time, the British Eighth Army under Field Marshal Lord Montgomery had their first victory over Field Marshal Rommel in the deserts of North Africa. Churchill and Roosevelt met in Cairo, and during the course of their meeting, Winston Churchill, I remember this was in 1941, four years before the war ended, Winston Churchill at that point said, Germany, Nazi Germany, is defeated. Nazi Germany is defeated. The enemy now is communist Soviet Union. If we spend all our efforts dealing with Nazi Germany and overlook the threat of Marxism, we will make a serious mistake. When, when Churchill sounded those words, he was really giving a message to Adolf Hitler. And the message he was giving to Adolf Hitler was simply this, Hitler, the writing is on the wall. You are through. It's all over. It may take a little time, but you are history. The writing is on the wall. Hitler didn't listen. The, the man who went to see his doctor, and his doctor said, you're 50 pounds overweight, you're smoking two packs a day, you're getting no exercise, your cholesterol level is astronomically high and your blood pressure is off the charts. Was told, if you don't get your weight down, if you don't stop smoking, if you don't get some exercise and get your cholesterol where it needs to be, you are going to have a heart attack. The writing is on the wall. And he didn't listen. And they had the heart attack. I think we're all familiar with writing on the wall stories. What we may not be as familiar with is that the expression, the writing on the wall, comes out of the Bible. And of all places, it comes out of the ancient book of Daniel. And to be more precise, chapter 5. And that's what we're going to be looking into this morning as we continue our studies on this ancient book of Daniel. You remember uh, that God had given a number of visions to Nebuchadnezzar. One of them was of, of, a, of a great statue. The head of it was gold and the, the chest uh, was of silver and the belly was of bronze and the legs were of iron and the feet were of clay. And you remember that Daniel had interpreted that vision uh, for Nebuchadnezzar and he told him in effect that whilst he was the head of gold, it was only a matter of time until various kingdoms would pass away and the only kingdom that would survive ultimately would be the kingdom of God. Well, what, uh, what Daniel had predicted began to happen in terms of Babylon and Babylon began to pass away. There was a slow rot. There was an inner disintegration. And in the place of the one superpower, Babylon, another arose. The power of the Medes and the Persians. The Medes and the Persians had victories, military victories, over, uh, over the, the Babylonians. And they were advancing on the city of Babylon. This was a time for vigilance. This was a time for men and women of principle to stand up. This was a time when they should be at the ramparts. This was the time when they should be taking seriously the situation in which they were living. But what we discover in Daniel chapter 5 is that far from that being the case, what actually happened was at the very time that the armies of the Medes and Persians were beginning to surround Babylon, they were having a drunken orgy. It's incredible, really, how people can recognize what is happening in their society and recognize what is happening in their culture, and instead of saying, we need to turn something around here, they simply go on living self-indulgent lives. Hard to credit, isn't it? But history has a way of repeating itself over and over again. 
There were three things that became very apparent in this particular orgy. Belshazzar, at one point in the proceedings, sent for the sacred vessels from the temple in Jerusalem. Nebuchadnezzar had destroyed the temple. He had brought the sacred vessels back to Babylon, but he had always had some degree of respect for them, not so Belshazzar. He simply takes these sacred vessels from the worship of the temple in Jerusalem and he begins to use them in his drunken orgy. Not only that, this particular event is characterized by an empty display of power and it is also characterized by a casual experience of sex. There's all kinds of sexual orgy going on at this point, which of course is what happens when people have feelings of inner loneliness and they're trying to suppress the feelings of loneliness. They don't want to get into commitment, so what do they do? They go from one shallow sexual relationship to another and in the same way that they hope they can convince themselves that insecure as they are, they're still in control. They hope that they can convince themselves that lonely as they are, they can have some kind of meaningful relationship without commitment. And of course, there was also the drinking. The drunkenness was rife. And what happens is this, when people have an inner sense of pain, and they can't cope with the pain, they will find all kinds of chemical means of chloroforming the pain and persuade themselves that the pain isn't there. And in this corrupt, failing, culture over which Belshazzar is presiding with the enemies at the gates, here is this man trying to make a display of power out of his insecurity, trying to demonstrate that he has meaningful relationships coming out of his loneliness, and trying to prove that he actually doesn't have pain when he is simply trying to chloroform it by chemical dependence. And our culture is not far removed. Our culture is not far removed. And it's at this particular moment that the writing on the wall appears. And the interesting thing about it is this, this event that is readily understandable, the significance of it totally escapes them. This week, there's a tragic accident, you all know all about it because there was a basic news blackout on everything else. And you know what happened. John F. Kennedy Jr.'s plane crashed and he and his wife and his sister-in-law went to a watery grave. That was a, a newsworthy event. What happened then, of course, was that we had endless commentary on it, endless articles on it, all kinds of people discussing it. And one interesting thing that happened was that Larry King invited Billy Graham to explain JFK Jr. Get the picture? Larry King wants Billy Graham to explain JFK Jr. Belshazzar wants Daniel to explain the writing on the wall. Why? Because very, very often in a culture, you'll have events and people sense their significance there, but they can't find the significance. They don't get the meaning. What is really going on here? And it's at this particular moment that God chooses to give a powerful message. And it comes, you'll notice, from a man who even the pagans say is indwelt by the spirit of the holy gods, or is indwelt by the spirit of deity. Always remember that in every secular society, there will be people inquiring, looking, searching for answers that their secularism can never give. And in that secular society, there have to be men and women and boys and girls in whom the spirit of the deity lives. They are the ones who can take the simple messages of life and show the eternal significance of them. The tragedy, of course, is this, that the writing on the wall escapes so many people, as it escaped Belshazzar. In the second half of chapter 5, Daniel comes before the king, 
And having simply said that he's not interested in all the, pri the prizes that are available to him, uh, he then goes on to remind Belshazzar of what happened to, to Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, Your Majesty, uh, Daniel says to Belshazzar, you have heard the story of your forebear, uh, Nebuchadnezzar. King Nebuchadnezzar had a vision one day, and I was asked in to interpret it, and I did. And let me remind you of the vision. The vision was of a vast tree, the top of which reached the heavens, and the branches of which covered the whole earth. And there was abundant fruit and nourishment in the leaves. The birds of the air found their shelter in it. And I was asked to interpret the meaning of this. But not only was there a vision of a tree, but there was a vision of a holy one who came and ordered that the tree should be chopped down, but that the roots should be left in the ground and bound by iron. And King Belshazzar, Daniel says, I interpreted that dream, and this was the interpretation. That that tree was the kingdom of Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar the king. And that God had ordered that the time would come when the kingdom would fall and Nebuchadnezzar himself would be humbled until he acknowledged that the Lord Most High is God. Or to put it in the vernacular, what was going to happen to Nebuchadnezzar was that he would fall from his position of, of authority he would have some kind of emotional, psychological, spiritual, and physical breakdown. He would live like an animal until in the end he would acknowledge something that God had been telling him over and over again. And you remember if you were here last week what God had been telling him over and over again. The message was this. I'm God, Nebuchadnezzar, and you're not. I'm God, Nebuchadnezzar, and you're not. And you will be humbled until you acknowledge that and the moment you do you'll be raised again because I'm going to leave the stump in the ground and Belshazzar Daniel says that's precisely what happened to King Nebuchadnezzar and he learned something fundamental and it was this that God will not tolerate arrogance God will not tolerate self-sufficiency God abhors pride on the part of his created beings because self-sufficiency and arrogance and pride are totally unwarranted. In fact, the scriptures say, God says, pride do I hate. Why, why is God so tough on pride? Well, remember the two commandments that were given. Commandment number one, love the Lord thy God with all your heart and mind and strength. Commandment number two, love your neighbor as yourself. Remember? Now what does pride say? Pride says, I don't need God. Pride says, I don't need to love God. Pride says, I'm perfectly capable of doing my own thing. So pride is actually a denial of the first commandment. What else does pride say? Pride says, I am the most important person. I am all that really matters. I am superior to all that's around me. And everything that is around me is inferior to me because I am number one. So I don't need God, and I don't need my neighbors. And I certainly don't need to love God, and I certainly don't need to love my neighbors. So pride is the breaking of the law. And God detests it. And he will do all kinds of things to bring people to the realization that they're not self-sufficient, they have no grounds for arrogance, they can't even keep themselves alive. And Bill Belshazzar says, Daniel, you knew that and you refused to listen. Not only that, you assumed that for some reason you could live in denial of the fact that only God is God and you're not and that you could in some way or other get away with it. Not only that, you chose to set yourself up against the Lord of heaven. It is one thing to ignore the Lord of heaven. It's an entirely different thing to challenge him. Not only that, says Daniel to King Belshazzar, you then had the audacity to profane that which God has called holy. God has set it apart as being holy, unique, distinct, set apart for him and for his glory, and you chose to think otherwise. 
So here's somebody who won't listen to what God says, thinks he can get away with it, sets himself in opposition to God, and then has the audacity to say that what God has called holy isn't holy at all. Here are a few things to ponder. What have we done in our culture with what God says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy? What have we done with the Holy Scriptures? How do we approach Holy Communion? What in the world have we done with holy matrimony? Belshazzar, the writing's on the wall for you. Because not only have you refused to accept the fact that God is God and you are not, you have set yourself arrogantly against him, you have decided that you're perfectly self-sufficient, you have declared profane what God says is holy, and you have refused to honor the God in whose hand your breath is. That's a direct quote from the old King James Version, which I rarely use, <laughs> but I like that expression. It impressed itself upon me when I was a boy. God is the God in whose hand your breath is. And I had a mental picture that stays with me day after day after day after day. Let me tell you about my mental picture. It's, it's, it's the hand of God. And resting in the hand of God is my windpipe. And my windpipe resting in the hand of God is being gently caressed between the divine thumb and forefinger. And for 68 years, 12 months a year, 52 weeks a year, 24 hours a day, 60 seconds a minute, he's continued to gently caress my windpipe. He is the God in whose hand my breath is. And he's caressed my windpipe as I've needed to breathe in the jungles of South America and in the mountains, whilst I've been down in Australia and whilst I've been in Europe while I've been with the impoverished people, while I've been out in the desert, while I've been all over the world in every imaginable circumstance, one thing he's continued to do is gently caress my windpipe. And one of these days, he will apply such gentle, gentle pressure on it. But that's all that will be necessary because I have such a fragile windpipe and he's such a mighty guard and he'll put ever so little pressure on it and he'll say, Briscoe, that's it. <coughs> <laughs> and you know something? I won't argue. No debate. That's it. And Belshazzar, you know this. You know this. You've ignored it. The writing's been on the wall ever since the days of Nebuchadnezzar. You thought you could get away with it. And now the writing is really on the wall. You have refused to honor the Lord in whose hand your breath is. Well, let's get to the message. You're dying to know what it was all about, aren't you? You say, no, we're dying to get out of here. <laughs> well, you want to know before you go. Interesting message. Mina, Mina, Shekel, Parson. Or variations on that. What we need to know about that particular message is this. The youngest child could understand it because it was simply three Persian words for a standard of measurement. So an equivalent would be dollar, 
dime, nickel. That was it. It wasn't the fact that dollar, dime, nickel suddenly appears on the plaster. It's this, it's this hand writing dollar, dime, nickel. The wise men can understand, hey, that says dollar, dime, nickel. And the people are sitting around and say, whoa, 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 whoa. Why do we have to have a hand doing that, writing dollar, dime, nickel on the wall? And the answer is this, that in the language there, you could take a noun and you could make a verb out of it. Now, I won't get technical here, but let me explain it to you. A friend of mine called Dr. Donald English came to America, and I saw him back in England after he'd been here. And he said, I had the most wonderful time in America. What a wonderful country. He said, it's really quite fascinating. He said, I went into a restaurant one morning, and they had a big sign which said, we serve breakfast at any time. So I asked for French toast from the Renaissance. <laughs> he then said, and they told me in America, you can verb any noun. He said, it's not interesting. You can verb any noun. Incidentally, verb is a noun, not a verb. So, what do we say in American English? Well, we say, let's fellowship. Fellowship is a noun, not a verb. So we access things. Access is a noun, not a verb. But don't worry about it, because the Persians did the same thing. So they verbed nouns. So here's dollar, dime, nickel. How do you verb those nouns? Well, you've heard about nickeling and diming people, haven't you? No idea what that has to do with it, but I thought I'd mention it to you <laughs> while we're going on. The point is this, that whilst these nouns were there, the verbs that came from those nouns meant, and this is the point, the verbs that come from those nouns mean appointed, evaluated, divided. Uh-uh, now we're getting somewhere. Dollar, dime, nickel, appointed, evaluated, divided. Now, says Daniel, God is telling you, Belshazzar, over and over and over again, you have not humbled yourself, you have been self-sufficient, you've been arrogant, you've shaken your fist in the hand of God, you thought you could get away with it, etc., 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 but your days are numbered you who are appointed, you have been evaluated, and the game is up, Belshazzar. Not only for you, but for the kingdom. That night, that night, the army of the Medes and the Persians, because you see, the leaders of the country were in a drunken orgy, they walked in unscathed and overthrew Babylon. They went straight into the palace, Belshazzar and his men are no way in a shape to, to defend themselves, and Belshazzar is slain, and that's the end of the Babylonian Empire. And the Medes and the Persians take over. The head of gold is finished, just as he said it would happen. So what's the point? The point, as far as you and I are concerned, is this. When God speaks, you're supposed to listen. And when God warns, you're supposed to heed. And when God sets you up in life, God evaluates. And when God says, humble yourself and acknowledge that I am God and you are not, you're supposed to do it. And if you go on saying no to God, one day God will say no to you. You got that?
When God speaks, you're supposed to listen. When God warns, you're supposed to heed. When God sets up, he evaluates. And if you go on saying no to God, one day he will say no to you. And don't say you weren't warned. Nobody within the sound of my voice now can ever say they weren't warned. That if they have lived in self-sufficient, arrogant denial and rejection of the Lordship of the God Most High in their lives, if they have lived that way, they need to be reminded right now, once and for all, that unless they humble themselves and begin to appeal to God for mercy and grace and forgiveness, that having said no to God, one day he will say no to them. C.S. Lewis put it this way. The man who goes on through life saying to God, not thy will but mine be done. One day we'll hear God say, all right, not my will, but thine be done. If you don't want me, God says, you don't have to have me. If you don't want my heaven, I am certainly not going to frog march you into it. If you're not interested in salvation, you absolutely don't have to be saved. If you don't want eternal life and the goodness and the righteousness and truth that's involved in it, but you want your own power struggle and you want your own sexual promiscuity and you want your own drunkenness, God says, be my guest. But he says it with a breaking heart. That's why he gives you the writing on the wall. And one more time, he's done it for us today. One more time. Don't go on saying no to God without admitting that he is perfectly free one day to say no.